as as I was instructed, this is referred to as the origins of ace ball in the biggest little city. And we, I mean, you know, we can talk about uh, the the start of, you know, um, the last conversation I had was with Mike Murray, who was a uh, PA announcer for the team for a little bit, works at Lotus Radio, and um, is basically uh, was was an integral part of the beginning of of uh, Reno Aces baseball here in Northern Nevada. Of course, Brian Moss with us here, as well as Doug Brown um, with DevCon Construction, Brian Moss with the Reno Aces. Uh, Brian, you came from Tucson, correct? That is correct. And what uh, what is your backstory? How did you get involved with, with all of this? And, and when did you come to Reno to say, oh, we're having our team play baseball right here? So, um, so I was with the Tucson Sidewinders from 2002 till its last season in 2008. And um, I left for a brief period to work in hockey for a season and then came back. And then the year when I came back in 2007, that was when the, the Catsoffs purchased the team in Tucson with the intent to relocate the to Reno for the 2009 season. And so I was just given the opportunity to relocate with the team and just obviously the idea of a new market, fresh start, new stadium is all intriguing. And I think as we'll sort of dive into this process, I mean, everybody in the business and in the industry um, and Doug has his own take on this, but the, the idea here is that everybody should be involved with the building of a new stadium and a new market once. Absolutely. <laughs> Doug, when, um, when, when you got the call or I, cause I don't know how um, construction works in, in the sense of uh, getting a bid or, you know, being uh, one of the three or five or eight companies that would be chosen. Um, how did DevCon get involved with the construction of greater Nevada field? Yeah, it was, it was very fortuitous. We uh, were, we knew it was coming. It was started to hit the papers that, you know, triple a baseball was coming to Reno but there was another local general contractor that had been negotiating the, the uh, project. And so no one really thought anyone had a chance. But all of a sudden the construction manager for the cat sauce at the time started calling around saying, hey, costs are getting out of control. We're gonna get some new opinions of costs. And they all of a sudden we jumped on, we said, hey, we got a great chance to do this. DevCon had a history of building stadiums in California. We had a Reno office now at that time for, you know, close to 10 years. And so we put our name in the hat and there was about eight sheets of drawings at the time that were sent out to about six firms. And we were one of the ones that responded with an opinion of costs. And we got an interview out of it. I think it was early April. We were one out of the three firms that were interviewed to do the project. Um, we went and interviewed over at uh, their, the Katzos attorney's office. And about a week later, we were told we were the guys doing it. So it was in April, one year prior to when the stadium had to open. And the whole part of it was, could we guarantee that we would have it done in a year? And we said yes. And it was very little information at that time and proceeded. One of the exciting things for me as a baseball fan, um, at the time I worked at a radio station that was directly across the street at 300 East 2nd Street. I was on the 14th floor and my office overlooked what was then the partial uh, a partial angle of the fire station and the motel um, that were both taken down for that area where the baseball stadium is now. And when the word came of a baseball team, a triple A baseball team coming and, and it was unsure of where the team was going to play, can either of you um, help dispel any of the, what was um, hearsay at the time that the uh, stadium was in, in limbo between Reno and Sparks because there was talk around town that it was going to wind up at Legends where all of the motels or all the hotels are being built and right there on the, the water, um, or it was going to wind up where it is now downtown at 250 Evans. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I can tell you what I know. I mean, I, I think a lot of that goes back to the origins of AAA, the original group that wanted to bring AAA baseball to Reno starting in 2002. 
and they the they had actually gotten an architectural diagram drawing of the of a stadium um, that was going to be placed at Legends. So mm -hmm. I think it had everything to do with the fact that there was a group that attempted to secure the financing. It was actually the the rental car tax that was approved in 2002, which has its own story for how the rental car tax obviously helped with the construction of our ballpark, you know, the, the private and public um, financing between the, the cat sauce provided, Herb Simon provided, and then the rental car tax. But um, so I think the, the sentiment behind all of it was that the original group that was unable to obtain all the financing necessary to build the stadium, wanted to build a stadium at Legends um, but because of, of they, you know, they weren't the group, you know, the, the you know, our current ownership that owns this, you know, built the stadium. Um, I think that, you know, the, clearly they wanted to look at other sites and, um, you know, I think they were also including the, where the, you know, where the mall, the old mall is where they're, you know, they're building down there on Moine, you know, on uh, Plum and uh, Virginia, yes. that, that was another site that was considered. So wow. I think it was just an evaluation of all the, those three sites that you know, traditionally a lot of ballparks at the time were being built in downtowns, revitalized area, you know, revitalizing downtown and all of that momentum. It just made sense to build the ballpark where it is today. And um, Doug, I don't know if Doug, if you have any any other insight other than that yeah. from a from a as sites were being. I mean, I think when you guys came on, I think you know we had already broken ground. So. <laughs> for, for, yeah, the site the site had already been established when we started meeting in April it was all focused towards the downtown Evan site. And Doug, when you guys, um, when you first showed up on site, um, do, do you have, is there a time frame when going into this that you know that yes, we obviously with opening day being a year from when you guys started to really break ground and get, get after it, um, it seemed as if like at times, watching like say for instance watching the helicopters bring in the light poles that was really exciting i don't know like i don't know how much you oversaw of that but watching it from my my office i'm like looking going wow this is awesome this is like this is really happening yeah well that's that's one of the best stories of the whole whole project you know the, there was a lot of innovative things that had been done we our first schedule that we put together it was a 14 month schedule from the time we actually broke ground on the stadium, which was until June. And so if you'd have taken 14 months, we would not have been playing baseball in 2019. It would have been the season following that. So we had to do a lot of innovative things. We had to erect steel without it being primed and have to paint it all in place. Uh, but one of them was, yeah, we had to fly all the, the stadium light uh, poles in. And not only was that innovative, having to helicopter those in at, you know, a later date in the sequence than what they should have been, but the first Saturday that we were going to do it, it was widely published. Hey, we're going to have helicopters landing light poles in downtown Reno. Yeah. So we had Cashel there. We had the media, you know, when I say Cashel, Mayor Bob Cashel, uh, who's a huge part of right, why the stadium's there. But we were all out there waiting for them and no helicopters. Well, the pilots had come in. There was we had to get special helicopters that could lift these the weight of these poles, and they, I think they came from Oregon. It was their Oregon or Washington, and they came down here and decided to go out partying the night before, <laughs> and weren't able to fly all the morning. And we only could do this on Saturday because we had to shut down all the roads around the stadium. So it had to been it had to be an early morning on a weekend on a Saturday. Yep. And so all of a sudden, Cashel's looking at me saying, "Why in the hell aren't we flying uh, any light poles this morning?" So I start calling our electrician and find out the pilots were still in bed. So we had to schedule it for the following weekend. Just one more twist in uh, the difficulty of building this thing. Yeah, because that's, it, what, it's, that's one of the first lessons I learned in Reno was the in Reno, the party doesn't stop until you want it to. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, I also wanted to ask you. Um, when uh, when clearing out all of the space for um, Greater Nevada Field at the time, it was just Reno Aces Stadium, and it wasn't yep. until the partnership with Greater Nevada um, Credit Credit Union, correct, Brian? Greater Nevada Credit Union, yeah, yeah, um, and that was uh, now we're going into the third year of that, if I'm not mistaken. No, actually, believe it or not, we're actually going into the fifth year. Excuse me <laughs> of that partnership, yeah. 
But I mean, but calling it Greater Nevada Field, though, um, it, I mean, you know, it, it, circling back to Reno Aces Stadium at the time, and you know, uh, bringing in the the beams and the the light poles, you've got the the sections of bleachers that were going, or not the bleachers, the sections of seats, the rows of seats going in, and like I said, watching it from the bird's eye view that that we had on the 14th floor, 300 East Second Street, like sometimes I would, you know. I would be so distracted with my my uh, with watching everything. My boss would like poke her head in my office. She's like, "Hey, you know, you've got an air shift to do." I'm like, "I know, but baseball." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just for reference too, uh, Chris, you know the 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 vantage point that you're talking about is the building in my background. Yes, yeah, the one just over your left yeah, shoulder. Yeah, the uh, the Basin Street building. Yeah. And so we were we like our offices, like our floor, um, like I said, my, my office overlooks um, overlooked roughly 70 to 75% of that whole area. So watching everything go down, I have, you know, some photos myself that I, I look back on and I'm like, wow, you know, there's uh, there's center field and that's where, you know, the fire and every day and every day Doug was in and around the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the site. <laughs> trying to make sure things got done because i mean the time frame was pretty miraculous that's one thing doug and i we've, we've shared over the years i mean i don't think people really understand the scope of work that needed to take place the changes that were um consistent i mean there were changes all the time i mean i doug and i we've shared that you know i was never in a lot of the you know the the daily the weekly meetings that were had about you know, things that were where we were with progress and things that had to get done. And I would hear sort of the bits and pieces. I would hear it from, you know, essentially from operations and ownership, like, hey, here's what happened today. And then I got Doug and I be, have, you know, become friends over time. And, you know, through that time, getting to know them and I would hear their perspective. And it was, it was interesting because clearly the perspectives were different from, you know, the actual physical work that was being done and those people that were overseeing it like Doug and, and his team and then obviously from the ownership perspective you know what was happening and so um, to your point Chris you know you were seeing it visually obviously you know we were too Doug was doing it physically yeah but you know the project that it took and the time and the hours and the people and I mean it, it was a feat I mean I, I don't think there's any way that you know Doug can elaborate more just being on the boot you know on the ground you know, every day, but, you know, to get the project done and the time that it got done um, with, you know, and, and everybody remember the year, I mean, this is 2008, 2009. I mean, you're mm -hmm. talking about an economic downturn in our country. And um, I mean, you know, there's, it just, it was a feat. So yeah, Doug, please, uh, you know, give more about that. Cause I'm like, like I said, from, from everything that Brian's saying and everything that I got to see clearly, you know, you were on the ground, like right there. So what was that like from, from your perspective? Yeah, no, it was, it, like Brian said, it was a, a great project to be done with. And for, for 10 months of our lives, we did not sleep or have a moment of rest uh, while we were building it. It truly was, we took a, a 14 month schedule that had to get done in 10 months from when we actually broke ground on the stadium side of it in June. And to, to compress that four months down, initially we started off just working six days a week and each of those were 10 hour days. Yep. And the last probably three or four months, we were working seven days a week and doing double shifts, which meant we had crews coming in at night to work. So then another crews would come in during the day and keep going. So it was continuous work for the last four months was the only way we could get there. And with, with lots of innovative things that, you know, we're talking, you know, the subcontractors, Martin Ironworks, is, which is you know, on the other side of the tracks from the stadium. Yep. When we first met with them, they said, there's no way you're going to do this. And we outlined about five or six things. And they said, well, we've never done that before. One of them was priming all the steel, erecting it all and priming it in place. Um, and there's just a lot of things that have just never been done before was the only way to get this done. Um, and it was, if you miss something on the schedule, something, it wasn't just didn't happen that day, but if it was two hours delayed, it was impacting the schedule for something that just, you know, didn't show up for two hours, showed up two hours late that given day. So it was, it had to be micromanaged. We had a great superintendent on the staff that literally worked for 10 straight months and did nothing else. Didn't take a single vacation day 
uh, to get this done and just micromanage the schedule. And part of it also was we, you know, our hearts were in it. We truly bought into this with our staff. Not only, I grew up here in Reno. I played uh, high school ball at Reno High. I had, a, you know, a father that uh, started, was on the uh, committee to get the Bobby Dolan dinner and save you and our baseball. Awesome. But then the rest of our staff, we had a, a guy named Mark Fogner who played ball at Galena High that ended up playing at Santa Clara. And another guy named Jim Wallace who played at Reno High that played also at Santa Clara and went to play in the New York Mets organization. So we got all these people on our staff that were truly bought in to bringing baseball to Reno. And, you know, it, well, it didn't hurt as bad when you're working 16 hour days, six or seven days a week if your heart's into it. Absolutely. And in, I, I, like, I love hearing the fact that you played, uh, you played here, you know, the, like a lot of your team all played here and, and being from here. So then, you know, you like the passion that goes into that is like even stronger. I run into people all the time, just at, whether it's at the stadium or wherever around town. And if they know me or if I happen to be wearing some logo gear and asked if I work here, but you, know, you run into people all the time that said, you know, they have whatever they did, you know, like I built that facade or I'm the guy who, you know, I'm the one who, who helped install the seats or, you know, I did the paint. I mean, you run into people all the time. You know, I laid the pavers and to Doug's point, I mean, I think it was such a community and it, I mean, it was the building of the stadium was such a community endeavor yeah. that, I mean, it was just, I think that's, that's how it, that's part of reason, probably how it got done. I mean, amongst a million other things, but just the hard work and soul of people dedicating their lives to getting it done, knowing that there was an absolute deadline that had to be met. <clears throat> I mean, we had contingency plans if we couldn't open on time, but believe me, there, there was no way we were going to not open on April 17th, 2009. I mean, yeah. I, well, and, and, well, and to be fair, was yeah, go ahead. I say it was like when we committed <laughs> to that date, because we, we knew that that there could have been contingency plans, but it was about October 15th when we had a meeting with the cat sauce and they said, Hey, can you guarantee this? We're going to lock in the opening day date. And at that time, we said yes. And we knew right when we said that, and every other person on that job site was behind it. We said we're going to get this done, and and we did, and worked through. Well, we had our, and, we had, and I think the and the winner. same month, the same month, we had our naming rights event, or not naming rights. We had the name the team event at I I think at the time. I mean, it's the you know it's the Radisson now, but it, well, I think it was the Sienna then. Obviously, that property's changed names a few times, but. Um, I remember that day because it, I believe it, I can't mean, obviously I'm not remembering the exact date today, but it was, and I'm pretty sure it was in October. And I remember Mayor Cashel, I remember Bob, you know, he was on the podium and I remember when he was doing his thing and saying his part of the, of the ceremony. And, and I remember he turned over the cat sauce and said, when are we opening? And then I think Stewart's at April, April 17th. And he yelled out April 17th and the crowd just went nuts. And then we're looking at each other like, Oh my God. I mean, <laughs> we've just now made this commitment and knowing again, knowing where we were with the construction of the stadium and knowing, I mean, you know, granted, you know, there is winter in Reno and knowing that there could be delays and we're just going, okay, well, you know, let's keep our fingers crossed. And I mean, you know, the good, the good news about having those kind of like timelines is, is, you know, you're working towards something, right? And so, you know, you've got to get everything done or as much as you can get done. So for, you know, from us, from the business perspective, we were like, okay, it's, it's, we're in total go mode now. I mean, this is about, we got to get people in seats and we got to get, you know, we got to get sponsorships sold and, and, um, and all of that was just through the process. So meanwhile, you know, we're on the back end working with, you know, clients and season ticket holders and, and really building up the momentum from a public perspective. Meanwhile, Doug's on the ground with his team building the stadium. And mm -hmm. I guarantee you, I mean, we still had so many people. And I don't know, Doug, if you heard a lot of this too, there were so many people, even though you guys, I mean, there was no doubt that a stadium was being built, but we had so many people still doubting it. Oh yeah, you guys aren't building it. That's not a baseball stadium. You know, what do you guys hire? You know, you know, and and, uh, and still, and people also not even understanding what the quality of the stadium that was being built. I mean, everybody had their minds of, 
of Moana Stadium, right? And yep. you know the traditions of that of that facility. And I remember to the point where the people would would when the stadium was built and people would come for the first time and it would all be about, oh my God, you know, and I don't even know who coined the phrase, oh, this is a raised, this is a raised Moana. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't even know what that means, except, you know, obviously, and then people just, they had no idea the standards that are required for a AAA stadium. Mm -hmm. And it just was, it was fun through that process because I mean, it was, you know, when obviously like anything else, you know, when you hear people doubting, doubting your work, right? Doubting what you're putting your heart and soul into. It just fuels you even more. And so those were always the, you know, fun things and always great to refute people or just, ah, just wait. <laughs> it's so just Doug, wait. To, to um, your note and to Brian note, uh, Brian's note as well, you guys were, were touching on two things that actually, to me, like tie into my, the next thing I was going to bring up. Um, so, so you guys were talking about the opening day when you, you know, the naming rights, when we're doing this, like the date is being announced. Meanwhile, from again, from the building over your left shoulder, Brian, at 300 East Second, as I'm looking out and watching everything happen, and Doug, you said you guys went from six days a week to seven days to double shifts to do to this, that, and the other. As I'm like even watching, and Brian, you you touch on it as I raise my hand when you know you said there's a lot of doubters. I'm watching, I'm looking, I'm like there's no way they're going to have opening day on April 17th. Cause I mean, in my own mind, I'm like, they're just, they're, they're behind on, I don't know what, but I'm like, there's it's in, I, as I like, I'm getting anxiety, you know, watching this, but also super uh, excited for, again, for baseball to happen in Northern Nevada. So Doug, what, like, what was the time crunch that, I mean, because you already said that that if something was an hour or two hours behind, it messed up the whole clock. Yeah, yeah. So, it, it, and part of this, yeah, it it took micromanaging the, the schedule uh, around the clock with it. But this this schedule could not have been accomplished, in my opinion, it, today in today's political and our current uh, city council and everything else. But back then, we had the support of Bob Mayor Bob Cashel. Mm -hmm. and he was fully committed and nothing was going to get in the way and honestly the, the cat sauce if you didn't have an ownership like that that wasn't afraid to come here and say no that's not we're not doing things as normal and we're not going to listen to the naysayers we're going to get this done um i, I told brian yesterday there's one great story i remember uh jerry cat sauce there was someone i think it was back then it was here pacific power company not MD energy but uh they said it was going to be a month or you know six week delay or something by getting power to the stadium because we didn't do this this or that or they didn't file whatever paperwork and jerry just looked at him nice and calmly and said hey what's your name i want to make sure i get this exact because when i tell the papers i want to make sure i get your name in the paper for the guy that <laughs> is the reason we're not playing baseball on april 17th and he's like oh no 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 we'll, we'll fix it we'll get it fixed but the same with Cashel. I mean, we never, to, when we got done with the project, we never had a building permit on this for a couple of reasons. They didn't have anyone at the city of Reno at that time that could have reviewed a full set of plans that, and got it done in time for us to build it. There just wasn't that expertise. Uh, but also when we started this, it, it literally was about 12 sheets of plans that turned out you know, by the time we were done about 1500 sheets. So it was being designed <laughs> as we were built. So, I laugh yeah, we because started I laugh because I feel like I've Doug, I'm laughing because I feel like I've seen almost every single page as we've looked at every, you know, over the 12 years, looking at every like CAD drawing of every little part of the stadium for some reason, you know, whatever that reason is. So I'm laughing because when you said 1500, I'm like, God, you know, I think I've seen just about every single sheet of those. Yeah. And, but what, and what Cashel did is he told the city uh, staff, he says, you will meet with them every two weeks. They'll give you the plans for what they're going to do for the next two weeks. And we'll review them together. We'll discuss them. And then we'll give them whatever inspections they need to keep going. And to, uh, we never even got a certificate of occupancy at the end. We got a temporary certificate of occupancy. <laughs> but there, there was continued pushback on uh, city staff. Back then, there was a redevelopment district that wanted all kinds of different things added to the off-sites with you know, different light standards and different types of colored concrete and repaving or putting pavers on Evans. And so through, throughout all of this, you know, if, if Mayor Cashel uh, and the Katzos got together and decided they want to do something different, 
well, we had the cities go all Cashel's full support, and we got this thing done. Um, and Cashel would personally come over about every two weeks and walk the stadium with us. And uh, having that level of support and interest was very vital to getting this done. So it's one of the things I, one of the things I, you know, when he, you know, when he passed away or, you know, a, you know, a year ago, I remember that I always remember that, you know, it, it's kind of almost like Mayor Bob's house, honestly, because we, you know, I always recall and will always remember Mayor Bob for when he would come to the stadium, you know, through the construction process, but even at, at games too. And he would walk the concourse, like he was walking the hallways of his house, like, he would walk it like he this was my house I own this place and I you know it was it was great and to Doug's point I mean I I know like we you know I developed such a great relationship with with Bob through this time because this this was really his baby and he and you know I don't know how many times he died on the sword literally you know trying to you know do whatever he needed to do to get things accomplished but um you know he deserves more than just his name on the plaque that's, you know, that's on the, that's on the building for sure. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I have, I have a question um, in ref in, uh, in regard to location of, of um, one area in particular. So we have the broadcast booth, the radio broadcast booth right above sections 109, 110. And it's right behind home plate. You've got the, the radio right there yet. The press box were over here above section 114, just past first base. It seems odd. It, it, it unless I'm the only one who finds it odd. I I'm I mean it's a I don't know. It, it, it might you don't have, find it as odd as Ryan Radke found it. As odd. <laughs> <laughs> but. but who, but I can, yeah, I mean, I can, I can tell you, I can tell you the evolution behind it. I, I'm curious to find, I'm curious to get Doug's take when he found out that we were doing this. But so we, you know, through this process, there were a lot of other um, teams, my, you know, AAA teams that had just recently built stadiums within about three, four, five years of, of Greater Nevada Field being built, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we consulted with everybody. I mean, the Caps Off love consultants. I mean, people were being brought in. I mean, it's, 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 you know, that's, and not just because of that. I mean, what's cool about our industry is we have so many resources that we can talk to for best practices and things like that. So, I mean, it's just the, you know, yes, we compete with them on the field, but we're not competing with them, you know, for our, you know, for in our local markets, right. We each are in our own city. So collaboration is one of the things that we really enjoy being in this business. So with that said, just in talking to different um, you know, teams that had built stadiums, one of the things that just somehow came up was just, you know, why do stadiums take their best locations and dedicate it to something that's non-revenue? I mean, the press box and the operation of the game is clearly critical for the guest experience, but from a revenue perspective, it's, it's just, why are, why do you take up those best spaces for when you could, you could be using those spaces for, for ticketed areas, in this case, suites. So it, we decided that we were going to just do something different that, you know, we couldn't do the radio, we couldn't do radio or television broadcast necessarily from where the press box is essentially overlooking first base. That's so, so the compromise was we had to figure something out. We were not a, you know, we're only a two level, you know, or facility, right? We don't have a, a, you know, we don't have two raised levels. So, so given that, we decided, okay, we're going to put suites where normally you put press boxes. We're going to move the press box where normally there would be suites, right? Figuring like people that, you know, those are great vantage points. I'm sure anybody that's been in the suites behind home plate will tell you that. And, um, but the idea that the radio broadcast building booth that we built on the concourse that, you know, we still had to put the broadcast there. So that's, that was sort of the, how the, the thinking behind the decision. I'm curious, Doug, when you heard about it, what was your reaction? Please. Yeah, the, you know, at that point, we, we didn't have too much reaction uh, to that. Um, we, that was exactly what we, you know, the cat sauce were saying at the time, dealing with the architect HNTV, that they wanted those suites right behind home plate to be their prime 
uh, revenue suites, and they were just going to move both the owner suite and the press box down the first baseline. So yeah, every I remember all the conversations Brian had, and there was a lot of discussions of that. It, and the, the cat sauce were were great. It, it made our life difficult in building the stadium with their continued going out consultants and visiting ballparks all over America. But they'd bring back ideas like the drink rails. I mean, they went to they saw a game in Philadelphia, and uh, Stuart and Jerry watched the entire game at, for with a general admission ticket right behind home plate on a drink rail. And they came back, and it was probably two months before we opened, and they came back and said, okay, we're putting drink rails everywhere. And they're, they're great. They turned out to be fabulous. No, and that's cool. what they would do. They'd come back with these ideas, and they're like, hey, we're doing drink rails. And, and then they'd go to Doug, like, you know, figure it out. Like, that's what they would do. It would just be figured out. And, it would, <laughs> and then they'd come back with Our the Our job call. wasn't hard enough maintaining the schedule, but then – they kept throwing those wrenches in. and it turned out to be a great experience uh, in, in adding all that stuff. But boy, was it difficult trying to, you know, add all that stuff to an already compressed schedule. Doug, what was your, um, what was your overall? Cause there's one of my notes here. Um, what, like when you go through the logistics of planning this, had you been part of a team that had built a baseball stadium before or any sort of um, stadium like this? And if so, like, what is the planning that goes in, goes into it versus we're breaking ground. This is when we find out opening day, we really on a t- we're really on a time crunch and we're playing baseball. Yeah. So not, none of our staff in Reno with DEFCON construction had done that. We did have the, our superintendent that we brought in and then our senior uh, manager, vice president from our corporate office, uh, had done some stadium work in California. And it was the relationship was great uh, for this one because we were already in pre-construction with some of our staff on the 49ers stadium with the same architect. Um, so this was like a dry run for the exact team that went and built the 49ers stadium. In fact, most of the DevCon staff, I was probably one of the only ones that didn't. Almost our entire staff left the Reno Aces ballpark after we got done building the Freight House District and went over to Santa Clara to build the 49ers Stadium. So, yeah, a lot of people don't know that. that that's, it's the same architect and the same construction staff that went from Reno to Santa Clara and did that job. Wow, that's incredible. Brian, in contrast to um, what you worked with in Tucson, um, at Kino Stadium, correct? Uh, it was, yeah, well, well, yeah, it, it was uh, Tucson Electric Park at the time. Okay. Um, now, in, it's, uh, now it's Kino Sports Complex. Okay, yes. so in, in contrast to um, wh- how you, you uh, what you worked with there and what you have here in Reno, what are, <laughs> if, if we can, like. <laughs> yeah, do, where do you start? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that the, the biggest thing take and there's a few but I think the biggest take to really get a perspective of the difference just from a management perspective so we own and operate greater Nevada field right so we call our shots when we need to get something done we get it done in Tucson we were renting the park you know the stadium the stadium was owned by Pima County so you know just and and we were I mean, we used to call ourselves, you know, people would say you're the second stepchild in, in, in a relationship or whatever you're in, you know, and in this case, when you're renting a facility, well, we were probably like fourth or fifth down the totem pole. I mean, it, you couldn't, I couldn't even begin. It would take me an hour just to tell you about all of that, right? But just the understanding that, again, when you own and operate your own facility, the control you have, just the ability to be able to get things done, but that's from that standpoint. The other standpoint, just from a physical point of view, um, Tucson Electric Park is, is, you know, if you've been down to spring training and granted, obviously it's been a long time, a lot more new stadiums are, have been built in, you know, in Phoenix. And so it's a tough comparison, but at the time as spring training was growing in Arizona, there was, um, you know, every ballpark was the same. So essentially you had nothing but a bunch of cookie cutter, stadiums they all pretty much look the same right and that's what tucson electric park was built for it was built for spring training and it's a nice park but the idea of it just being sort of just you know bland and brown and 
<laughs> it just doesn't have the same character, right? Um, being that this site was built in pretty much a really small footprint. I mean, seven acres for a stadium, and you know, Doug can allude to that too. It's very small. It's a it's a very small footprint. I mean, there's definitely some things that you know you look back and you wish you would have we would have done some different things with better know how to feel. Don't get me wrong, but just the idea of just you know the location, the amenities. Um, I mean, it's it's held up so well um, in 12 years. I mean, people still walk in and we tell people it opened in 09 and they're just like, yeah. oh. Um, you know, I mean, we do, we, we, you know, Hey, don't get me wrong. We spend a lot of money every year in, in maintenance and we've up and we've updated it. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, we've, again, we're fortunate enough to have the ownership group that we have with the Simons that, um, you know, allow us the, the, you know, the ability to, when we see that we need to upgrade this or upgrade that, um, you know, they're very committed to everything we do and they understand that, you know, having new experiences and having those updates and maintaining a clean facility is important. So, yeah, I, I can't say enough about, you know, again, this stadium and the comparison to, to what two solid Group park, you know, is and was, um, is, you know, and the, and the weather, I mean, geez, you know, I mean, I don't think people really understand the weather that we have in Reno in the summertime to compare just about to everywhere in the country when it comes to watching baseball. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I you know, and I know anybody who watches this will tell me, you know, yeah, but we play baseball in, in April and, and April weather sucks. And yeah, we know that. But, you know, we have most of May and June, July and August and it's into September where the weather is awesome here and it's it's not too hot and it's dry and so it makes just those experiences so much better. I mean, if you've ever been to Tucson in the summertime, you know, it's, it's warm and it's, you get humid, you know, humidity with the monsoons and the monsoons are just, a, I mean, God, when you have the threat of rain every day, thinking that every game you're going to have, you could literally go into every, you know, go to work every day in the summertime, knowing that you could have a delay or a rain out or whatever. And, and then just the way that the grass was maintained in Tucson and, just the, you know, just the grounds in general. And just because we just didn't have, you know, the control over the, over the facility, like we do now, it, it's a, it's, it's night and day. And, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's great to just have that different. I mean, that was the biggest difference really is just, you know, walking into something new and, and uh, just really being able to dictate a lot of what you do day to day and, and uh, be able to get things, you know, for, if a toilet broke, you could fix it. If a toilet broke in Tucson, you know, bring out the caution tape because you weren't going to be able to use it that night. I mean, that that's what it was. Um, Doug, when you or when you come to games at the at the stadium and you look around and everybody's having, you know, a good time, enjoying themselves. There's, you know, kids running around, people are are there, whether it's the first time or their hundredth time. Is it does it bring a sense of satisfaction knowing that you are an integral part of bringing community together? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, Brian will tell you, I probably have gone to probably more games than just about anyone else. I probably attend 40. <laughs> I, I want to add to that when you're done. First... I want to add to that when you're done, Doug, because that's, I will yeah. share. Yeah. I think, I think the audience should know more than what you're, you're being very humble, but keep going. <laughs> but, hey, I come to those games and every single time, there's not a time I don't just sit out there and smile and look around. And or a lot of times I just walk the concourse during the games and just brings back memories. And it's just soulless knowing that, that we have that there. And, we, and more than anything, we're done with it. When, when we finally, we got done with the stadium one week early in 2009, or sorry, 2009, and right when we had that temporary certificate of occupancy, after really not resting at that time for about eight or nine months, I went and got a six pack of beer, went up to our new suite, put it in the refrigerator and just sat there for the day and drank a six pack of beer and just stared out at the stadium without any phone, without any computer, or any noise uh, for one full day. And just soaked it in. It was it was great. But that the first year, you, you get back to maintenance. So we're you know the DevCon suite, which we still uh, have today, is right next to the owner suite. And the first year, the Katzoffs and Herb Simons came to a lot of the games, 
And it wasn't that great having the suite right next to them because anytime there was a problem with the stadium that first year, they would just interrupt us while I'm trying to watch the game. They're like, hey, the toilet down you know, behind third base isn't working. You go get take care of that. Uh, but uh, it still, it was, it's been great going to the games. Yeah, um, even to this even to this day, what I wanted to add to Doug's comments was, you know, this goes back to just, you know, to 2019. Um, and there were more than once, and, and I don't know if Doug's going to be just thinking about it, but there were times when it would, you know, he talked about what he, what he did when the stadium was built. Well, he still continues that tradition. Although as he's gotten older, now it's gone from a six pack of beer to a bottle of wine. <laughs> and so, I mean, I've, there's been times during games where it's just him in in the suite and you know whether he invited people and they you know they they you know he doesn't just do this always by himself by the way but um because sometimes it's just more that people just haven't shown up yet right but he's just there before anybody else um but there's definitely been times that he's been there by himself and he's got his bottle of wine and and he's just soaking it in and you know and like i said i i think you know i'm smiling now but i i think it has everything to do with the fact of just again, it, it's that sense of accomplishment that I think, again, just like anybody, you know, in you, your own house or whatever you do and you you build something, right? And, and it's just that sense of accomplishment that you you probably just, you know, will probably always stay with him, right? I mean, I don't doubt that for a second. I mean, you know, I can only approach it from just the outsider perspective. I mean, being working for the organization, but, you know, like I said, you know, I didn't hammer one, one nail in the facility I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot, I've said, there's a, there's definitely a lot of little things that I know that there are things that are within the stadium that I directly had influence on, um, but not, not to the level of Doug with actually just, you know, from the dirt, <laughs> from the dirt up. Doug, I can say this um, as, like I said, this, this, my excitement for baseball to happen in Reno and, and especially to the level of, um, looking and, and Brian will tell you this, um, looking at the stadium as my Graceland. So there was a time, um, th there was an event that happened on, uh, uh, I want to say Mother's Day weekend about three years ago. And the, the there was a, an event that I had to MC that I was asked to MC. And they brought food, but they had a tent set up on the grass out in front of the stadium. And it was in the middle of the grass. And I was really hungry and they said, oh, we have pizza over there. And I said, oh, that's great. Um, how do I get to it? They, and the girl who set it up, Brian, it was Chloe. She goes, you just walk over there and get it. I go, yeah, I, I don't I don't walk on the grass. And she goes, what do you mean? I go, this is great. <laughs> like, I don't walk on the grass. And she goes, well, if you want a piece of pizza, you're going to have to go walk on the grass. I'm like, Oh, this is going to be so awkward. It was the first time in, in, in at that point, almost 10 years that the stadium had been up that I walked on the grass and, and there was an event that, uh, that Brian and uh, another coordinator that we had at the stadium, Sean, um, had set up around Halloween two years ago. And it was set up on the grass and I'm like, even then I'm standing on it going, oh, this is really awkward. Like, <laughs> I don't want to be on the grass. I mean, I love that. I love that place so much. And, and I, I mean, it doesn't matter where I'm at in the building. If we're underneath the scoreboard out in left field, if I'm, you know, talking with people uh, behind section 120 right there at the, at the, at the refreshment stand four, or, you know, if we're behind home plate right underneath the broadcast booth, it's, it's just, it is a sacred place. And I absolutely, I mean, as a baseball fan, I don't, I'm, not only am I grateful to meet you face to uh, face to face, at least on here, um, but I want to say thank you personally for being a huge part of bringing this stadium to life. Yeah, well, well thank you. It's, yeah, it was it was a great, great accomplishment. And like I said, it was great to be part of it. I, I, I avoided going down to the 49er stadium because I left all my energy right here in Reno on this one. <laughs> We had other people that still had some energy left, I guess, because they went over there. But I, I didn't have any left. I, I stayed here in Reno. You got to enjoy. No, that just meant you got to enjoy a lot of baseball games that year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. it's, and it's still 
great experience. I can't tell you how many times I've had people, you know, groups in my suite over there that they come in, they, they don't, you know, they watch like an inning or two, but they just say the experience is what they come there for. It's a, it's a, and, and that's what the cats us always said. Yeah, you know, we always couldn't understand growing up here in Reno. You needed more parking. People need to, you know, we're, we're used to you and our football. You show up five minutes before the game starts and you hear the cannon and you walk in to see the game and it's done and you leave. That's not what this has become. You, you show up early, you park somewhere else downtown, you get dinner there, you come to the game and it's, a, it's an experience. Uh, it's just not going to a game. Yeah. That, and, and Brian will tell you, you know, it's, 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 it is an experience. I mean, like, running around the concourse interacting with fans when i see brian it's like i'll stop we'll talk we'll hang out all of a sudden i look at the scoreboard i'm like i got one out i gotta go <laughs> i mean yeah. it, it's yeah. it's in a, it's an electric place and and brian you uh this is uh, uh this is a point of reference that we had in a conversation with mike murray um recently you are one of the the last standing original members that you're one of the ogs for the building well, I, I've, you know, I don't know. I've, there's going to be one of two things that's going to happen. Either there's going to be a plot for me in center field or a statue by the home sign. And I'm not sure either one will actually happen, but you know, they've talked about it. So who the hell knows, you know, and I mean, Eric brings up all the time. We laugh at it too. And it's starting to resonate obviously more now, 12 years later, but he, we've always said that, Hey, you know, and, and what minor league baseball is, I mean, it's the idea where you, you know, we've, you know, from people that have worked for us that have moved on to such great careers with, you know, other teams or whatever they've moved on to be successful. And there are so many success stories throughout the years. Um, you know, we've always said like, Hey, you know, people, you know, no one's going to retire here. Um, I don't know, man. I mean, it's starting to get to the point where, <laughs> I mean, well, that hat, well, that, you know, God, I don't know. I mean, I doubt it, but you know, I, you know, I've been here for a long time. We've, I, I've, I've, um, there's always, um, you know, we've, we've, we are faced consistently with challenges, um, new opportunities. I mean, it never gets old. Um, I, it just doesn't, I mean, we're, you know, it, it just, that's what I like about our business. That's what I like about what we do. Uh, we're always being innovative. We're always trying to find new creative ways. Uh, to Doug's point, to your point, Chris, the experience is what we control. The experience is really what we're selling, you know, to our community. And um, that experience has to consistently be, you know, reinvigorated, has to be, you know, recharged each and every year. So we have to be, you know, consistently thinking about how do we improve the experience? How do we you know, how can we keep the experience at a high quality level? I mean, those are all things that we focus on, you know, I don't want to say daily, but a lot. <laughs> and um, it's, you know, it's what we, you know, it's what we build our brand. It's what we built our brand on is that because we don't control what goes on in the field. I mean, we don't know players change all the time. I mean, you know, we know it's quality baseball, but it just, you know, there's, it's so hard to put our, you know, to put everything on, on the shoulders of, of our players that, you know, are here for, you know, whatever, however long a week, a month, maybe the season, but very rarely do you see players coming back multiple, you know, every year, it just, it just doesn't happen. It's not the evolution of how, how baseball works. So, so for us, it is everything about the experience and the stadium that we can house our games in. Absolutely. And with that said, um, I want to say thank you, Brian Moss and, and from the Reno Aces, as well as Doug Brown from DevCon Construction. This, uh, the, the origins of Ace Ball in the biggest little city and how it came to fruition. I mean, this conversation, I think, I, I mean, I've not only learned a lot, um, you guys have, have reignited more of that spark in me personally to be back on the field, to be engaged with the fans, and most important, to see Reno Aces baseball return to Greater Nevada Field this year. Yeah, we can't wait. Absolutely. I'm sure, and I'm sure Doug. You know, we Doug and I talked. I mean, I know he's he's waiting to go into the suite with his bottle of wine. I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there. All right, gentlemen. Okay. Uh, well, fingers crossed. Thanks, everything, everything's on track for opening day. Great. We'll see you at the stadium. <laughs>